Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of the Strong Dad Army podcast. And today my guest is none other than Royal Marines veteran and Invictus Games super amount of medal winner. I don't know how many medals he's won, but Mark Almerod, welcome on, welcome on to the show. Excuse me, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. How are you doing, mate? My pleasure. I, I'm doing fine, mate. I'm uh, made up that you've managed to... Uh, to come on, mate. I really appreciate it. So, uh, how are things? How are, you, how are you at the moment? Obviously, we we're, we're kind of you know we're well out of lockdown and all that kind of stuff. But there's some people panicking about whether we're going to be in lockdown again. But how's, how's all that kind of stuff treated you and your family? You know, to be honest, mate, I just look at everything with common sense. Yeah. And uh, I just continue to live my life, you know, within the rules, just using common sense making sure that my family are looked after and they're happy and they're healthy and no one's going mad because we're locked in a, you know, effectively a prison cell 23 hours a day. So we're, we're all doing really well. We've, we've managed it all really well. We have resumed back to some sense of normality mm -hmm. and my, my crazy life hasn't really slowed down at all throughout the whole of lockdown. Mm -hmm. mm. Has, has that been um, just like busy with this kind of stuff, maybe podcasts and stuff? Cause I'm assuming obviously with, with being locked down, You've not necessarily, uh, or a few months back, you didn't necessarily get to sort of travel about and so. What, what have you been, you know, what have you been doing to sort of keep busy during the uh, the last few months? So, in in my day job, I actually have a what I call a real job, yeah. um, and I work for a charity called RMA, the Royal Marines Charity. Mm -hmm. So I was furloughed for about four weeks in the beginning, but then straight off of that, so I've been kept busy with that you know, working remotely. I, I host a podcast for those guys. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff virtually. Then on top of that, um, I work as a, as a speaker. That's really died a death, but I've also done some, some virtual events um, throughout lockdown. I have been editing my first book, finishing my second book, trying to organize publishing deals, recording audio books. I signed a contract for a movie. Wow. Um, Oh, it's just been mad, mate. And, and I've got so many plates spinning and other projects I want to do that I don't think I'm going to get a day off until about 2065. <laughs> so is that a good thing for you then? Is it, are you one of these guys who just likes to keep busy or is, it just, is this just how things have happened, you know, and it's kind of like, shit, I've got a lot going on or is, or is that a good thing for you? It's, it's always been like this, mate. But yeah. I, I'm so lucky in the I mean, it sounds like, you know, super busy. And it is but I've got so many cool people around me, yeah. you know, that, you know, the, these teams that I've created, mm -hmm. you know, they, they take a massive load off of me. So that's how you're able to do it all, you know, because people are out there willing to, to help me and to open doors for me. So it's not like I'm doing everything 24 seven. Yeah. But I do like to be busy. Yeah. Same here, to be honest, mate. I get, I get bored very easily. You know, it's like, yeah. You know, I'm thinking to myself, when the kids finally get back to school and all that, I'm going to have all like this extra free time. But I know I'll fill that free time like that with yeah, nothing that's relaxing in the slightest, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So, mate, so I tend to, you know, just sort of start it, you know, early days with people, you know, the guys I have on the uh, on the podcast is just, you know, maybe give us a bit of background about your childhood, mate. You know, what were you, what were you like as a kid? Were you good kid, bad kid, you know, do you do well in school? Were you sporty? What, you know, what were you like? I was chubby. Mm -hmm. I was cheeky. And I did average at school. Yeah. So, um, not sporty at all. No. You know, I, I ran around every once in a while playing five aside with the lads, but you know, never supported a football team, rugby team, wasn't into football, rugby, or any of those mainstream sports. I, I got more into sport, into martial arts when I was about 12. Right. But prior to that, it was just, you know, running around, getting into trouble and mischief with my friends, um, like all kids do, um, until I discovered martial arts. Uh, about 12, I, I started with full contact kickboxing, then gravitated towards Muay Thai, and then when I was um, when I was serving in the military, I, I boxed at heavyweight. But left school with um, I, I, I would say they were average grades. I got nine A to C's, so a couple of A's, a couple of B's, some C's, and then one D in my GCSEs. So did all right. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Because yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not an academic, so no. you know, I, I don't know how it happened, but I did all right. <laughs> yeah, did better than you probably thought you would, maybe. Better than the, the mock exams, yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool, nice, yeah. nice. So I know, um, like I said, I've, you know, done, done a little bit, of, a little bit of research on you today, and I know, like, when you joined the the Marines, I, I think I'm right. Now I've got this from Wikipedia, so I take everything with a pinch of salt. Now, however, um, you joined the Marines at quite a young age, is that right? It is, yeah. Um, Signed up at 16. Wow. Joined, joined at 17. Yeah. Yeah, and then I um, I finished my training at 18. Right. So did, how did this come about for you then? Like, were you saying, I mean, I know obviously it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be like sporty as such to, to join maybe the military or anything like that. But I mean, what, what sent you that way? Was it was it um, just sort of fate or was it something you'd always thought about? Or was it just you happened to just walk past maybe? I know some, we get some, you know, I've heard some stories about people just going past like a, a bit of a stand in a town centre, you know, with the recruiting or, you know, what, what, what pulled you in there, mate? It's a mix of things, really, you know. So I was, I was born in the 80s, raised in the 90s, big fan of Arnie, Stallone, Van Damme, yeah. and, you know, all these guys. So I grew up, that, that's what led me down the martial arts route, do you know what I mean? All these yeah. big fancy fly kicks and muscles and being the hero, you know, the tough guy, but the gentleman. And, um, like when I started martial arts, it kind of exasperated that, and I felt more at home in that kind of role, you know, physical, yeah. pushing myself, growing, getting stronger, fitter, faster, more able to look after myself, more able to look after other people, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. And where I grew up, all of the guys I went to school with were about two years older than me. So right. they all finished school before I did. And a lot of them joined the army and they went into the tank regiment that were based over in Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. And they'd come back on the weekends when I was at school and, and they would be out drinking. They all had new cars on finance and all this stuff. And I thought, I want a bit of that. These guys seem to be doing all right. I'm going to go in the military. And I live in a town in, in a city called Plymouth, um, which is a huge military city. You know, there's a lot of Royal Marines around here, um, huge naval bases. Yeah. But I didn't actually know who the Royal Marines were. And I just thought, if you're going to join the military and, and be a soldier, you join the army. So I went down to the career center, spoke to the recruiter. I was, I was only 15 and a half at the time. And he gave me the paperwork. So I took it home to get my parents to sign it. And then my dad told me that I had an uncle who had actually served a full career, 22 years in the Royal Marines. And he had made his way from the rank of Marine, which is our equivalent of private up to a captain by the time he left mm -hmm. and he only lived 20 miles up the road so I, obviously i knew him i just didn't know what his background was in his career and all that lot yeah. until i expressed an interest in it so i went up and saw him and he told me about life in the royal marines and a little bit about his career and the things he'd gotten up to and how they were different to the army and that the you know different kind of career i could expect so i went back to the career center on the monday morning and I uh, spoke to the Royal Marine recruiter and he put in this, uh, this dusty old VHS cassette into the TV video combo machine. That's how old I am. <laughs> and man, I just watched this video and I'm like, who the hell are these guys? You know, it was like what I watched in the movies, you know, with the, the Schwarzeneggers and Commando and Predator and, you know, Rambo. You know, these guys were jumping out of planes, you know, with ropes, you know, fast rope. And they were walking through the jungles. They were up to their necks in water patrolling. And then they were in the Arctic living in snow holes and skiing and, you know, speed boats flying along with guys in the back, weapons on their back, ready to go and take someone out on a beach assault. And I was like, this is what I want to do. These guys yeah. do it all. They jump out of the plains from the sky. They're on the land. They're on the sea. They're in the Arctic, the desert, the jungle, the woodland. They, these guys go everywhere and do everything. I want a piece of that. Yeah. So um, I got that paperwork took it home, got it signed, put it in, went back to school, waiting for a phone call or a letter from them while I was uh, continuing to study for my GCSEs. And then finished the exams and got the letter saying, come and do a three-day, uh, what they used to call it, a potential War Marines course right. at the Commander Training Center in Limston. And we'll see, firstly, if you're ready. And secondly, if this is actually what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so you go out there for three days, and it's just a beat down. Well, it used to be that they've stopped doing it now. They've, they've advanced what they do and they do something different. But it used to be just three days of, of getting thrashed 
you know, up at five in the morning and all day gym sessions, assault courses, push-ups, runs, pull-ups, just to weed out the people that either aren't physically and mentally prepared mm -hmm. or, you know, on the other side of the fence to give us as potential candidates an opportunity to go, actually, this isn't for me or no, this is perfect. This is what I expected. This is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I was fortunate. I passed that first time, came home. And then it was just a case of, I mean, this was prior to email and stuff. So I had to wait for a physical letter. Yeah. Just waiting for my training program to turn up. And they sent me a program saying, this is what you need to do. These runs on this time, at this week, then you need to advance into boots. You need to be able to do this many pull-ups by this time. This is the date you join in, February 2001. Wow. And that was it? That was all I cared about from that minute. As soon as I passed that three-day course, I got back on the train. I only live 45 minutes from where we do our training anyway. And I just couldn't stop smiling all the way back. I'm like, that was hard, but I feel so good after those three days. And this sounds really nasty and a little bit sick, but it was nice watching people just drop off. You know, as the days went by, I think there was like 65 of us to start with. Yeah. And then you know, blokes just dropping off hour after hour after hour because they, they either couldn't take it or didn't want to do it. And then to be in that final handful of like 15 people mm -hmm. to go, we want you, go back, start training, come and join us and see if you can do the full, which at the time was 30 weeks, felt great. And then that's all I did. I was like, that's, this is it. I'm not, I'm not failing this. This in my gut, I'm like, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And nothing else matters. You know, so I just went at it. Yeah, and that's and like with you saying then about like watching these these other guys drop off, it's like I can completely get where you're coming from because like it's it's that extra boost for you in it. Like when, when that happens, you see this one or two guys dropping out, then that has surely got to trigger something in your head, thinking I'm actually doing all right here. You know, and it's you, you know it's no. Do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like? You know, in that movie Highlander. Yes. Right. Every time someone gets their head chopped off, the guy that chopped it off like gets their energy and everything. It was like that. Like every time someone dropped off, I was like, and I'll steal their energy and I'll keep going. No, oh, it's brilliant. Nice. So, um, so obviously that, like you say, you joined uh, 2001. Did you say it? February 2001. Yeah. 2001, nice. Um, now, no, obviously the, there's a big chunk in between. But how long was it until you were you sort of? How long did you you know officially serve for? My, my entire career? Yeah, yeah. 10 years. 10 years, wow. Yeah, it was 10 years. Good time, though. Yeah, I can only imagine, mate. I can only imagine. So, um, I know, obviously, we've got this this story, which, you know, we'll come to, um, that took place in uh, Afghanistan, I think. Um, but, like, uh, was, was like how often were, did you did you go away? You know, when was it your first sort of, what, you know, toured, if you like? How, you, how young were you then when you were first sent away? actually on duty and as opposed to training, if you like. So I signed up at 16, started training at 17, finished my training at 18. And by the time I turned 19, I was in Iraq, March 2003 on wow. Operation Telic 1. Um, in that first wave that went over the Kuwaiti Iraqi border yeah. uh, into Iraq to take the palace and the oil fields and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I finished my training in October 2001. So four weeks before that was when we watched 9-11 happen. So we knew, you know, as soon as we finished, we were going to be doing something. And um, we just didn't know what at the time. So, yeah, straight in there at 19. Yeah. Well, actually, now you mentioned 9-11, and, and we just briefly, before we start recording, we're talking about uh, Martin Stapleton. And on the episode that he um, he did with, with me on this, he was, um, I think he said that when, on September the 11th, he was actually on a plane waiting to go on a training course. I think he said to America, actually, I might be wrong, but he was sat on the plane with the rest of, you know, rest, rest of the Marines and uh, somebody just got on board and said, get off the plane, something's happened, go back and you'll be, you'll be told more shortly. He said, and he knew something serious had happened, but he obviously, obviously didn't know it was as, uh, as serious as it was. So it's just interesting to know uh, what was going on around those times. So, mm. um, and so then we move on to... Am I right in thinking 2007 when you were in Afghanistan? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I came back from Iraq. Um, you go on a couple of exercises. You know, we, we sailed down to America. Like I said earlier, I did the boxing for a little bit. 
Ah. Um, took a bit of time out, uh, got back amongst it. And uh, 2007, September 2007, uh, Afghanistan came around for Operation Herrick 7. Mm-hmm. Mm. So it was a six monther. Um, well, it should have been. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, Christmas Eve that year, routine foot patrol, and I stood on and detonated an improvised explosive device. That's Christmas. Yeah. So, yeah, not the best Christmas I've ever had. Uh, I can only imagine, mate. Yeah, it was, it was pretty rough. Right, so this was a IED, you say, yeah? And um, so if, if it's okay with you, maybe you could maybe just, you know, talk us through, you know, the, 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 whatever, you, whatever you're happy to, to talk about there, mate, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, we were halfway through the tour. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our job was to go out there patrolling a certain area of Afghanistan, the, the company that I was working in, and to dominate the ground, you know, and take the fight to the enemy, look after the civilians that were there, provide some security and stability. So we were out all the time, you know, and we we're always gathering intelligence. We know where minefields are. We're trained to identify pinch points and vulnerable locations where people are likely to dig in IEDs and, and that kind of stuff. And we've been out loads of times, you know, with, with no issues. We've, we'd had loads of firefights with the enemy. You know, they, they didn't even come close to grazing us. You know, we just sent them packing every single time. And Christmas Eve came around and we were just going on another foot patrol, you know, and another routine foot patrol. So we've done it a thousand times before. The ironic thing about this patrol was the ones we'd done before you know, we, we were given a mission, you know, like any location here, go disrupt it. There's a weapons cache here, go and destroy it or confiscate it. And we'd be out for five, six, seven hours. We'd push two, three, four miles out. You know, that was the norm. Now this patrol, all we were told to do was because we didn't have a lot to do and it was Christmas and we were looking for a bit of downtime. We, we knew we had to get out on the ground to, to maintain the momentum that we built because you're always being watched. And if you break that momentum for any reason, then to the enemy, it's like a vulnerable time where they look to attack. So we didn't have a mission for this patrol. It was literally two sections, eight men in each section, form up at the rear entrance of the camp. Leave the camp, one go north, one go south. Patrol the immediate perimeter. We got told not to push any more than 300 meters out. So like I said before, we were going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine miles. We weren't even allowed to go more than 300 meters on this top, this one. Right. Then when we get to the opposite side of camp, to the front entrance, just go through your drills, secure the location, close things down, get yourself in and finish up. So that's all it was. It was literally get out there, show these guys watching you that you're out there. I mean, they have no idea what if we had a, an objective or not. It was just to show them what we're out there. Mm-hmm. And uh, then come back in and we'll take a couple of days R&R. You can open up the mail on the, all the Christmas cards and letters and that kind of stuff you've got. We'll have a little bit of a do. And then, you know, two days later, we'll get back amongst it and, and start taking the fight to the enemy again. So we had no cause for concern. You know, everyone was pretty chilled. Morale was pretty high. And uh, we set off. You know, they opened the rear entrance of the camp. I was second in command of the section. I went north. Other guys went south. Went out on the patrol, did all of those normal things that we usually do, what we call uh, SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures. So speaking to the locals, gathering intelligence, reporting back any suspicious signs of enemy activity and and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And about five hours later, both of these sections were now on the opposite side of camp at the front entrance, ready to finish up for the day. Now, my section were located on a piece of high ground, like a, like a ridge line, um, what we call the North Fort. Uh, it was one of our, our target indicators if we ever came under contact from the enemy. Now beneath us, so when we're looking off this ridge line down, we can see the camp that we're working out of a place called Ford Operating Base Robinson. And then beneath that, further still, was the other group of men that we left with earlier in the day. So... Because we're so high up, we're in a a tactically advantageous position for numerous reasons. You know, first of all, we can see everything around us for like two miles. So we've got the the vantage point. 
Second of all, you know, it's a lot easier if you come into contact with the enemy to fight going down a hill than it is going up a hill. So we got tasked with giving those other guys who were in a vulnerable position what we call overwatch, which basically means the eight men in my section will take up fire positions. We'll make sure that we've got all round defense and we'll cover them while they go back into camp. They'll then get behind the perimeter wall. They'll be safe. They'll cover us. We'll come down off the high feature, go into camp, job up. So like I said, very basic, low level, standard kind of stuff. You know, nothing that we hadn't done a million times before. Yeah. So we get given the tasking and the guy in charge, a friend of mine, Corporal Sean Halesby, he takes his half of the section and starts giving them fire positions. And then I take my half and 12 o'clock from my position, about four meters in front of me, was like a, a shallow bowl in the ground. Now, normally, if you're going to go far on a patrol, the first thing you want to do is try and get behind some cover, you know, cover from view, cover from fire. And normally you would get behind a tree, a building, a rock, a shrub, you know, anything that's going to give you some form of protection. But because we're so high up on this ridge line, that there wasn't any of that kind of stuff up there. So I thought if we jump in this little bowl, we're high anyway, so it's going to be hard to see us. But if we get on our bellies, it's going to be impossible. You know, no one's going to see anything. So given the terrain and the environment, that was the best form of protection that we had. So I jumped in, the lads all started taking up their positions. I stood back, I observed for a little while to make sure that everything was running smoothly. Um, did a couple of checks, a couple of last minute checks that I had to do to make sure that we were well defended in case there was a small arms attack. And then I started walking over towards the position that I'd selected for myself. And as I got there, and I went to get onto my stomach as I put my right knee on the floor. That was the minute that I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Um, I do remember it all. I will, I will give you the, the shortened version, if that's all right. Um, Absolutely, mate. Whatever, whatever, going... Whatever's okay with you, mate. So... Basically, I knelt on this device, it exploded. And if you can try and imagine what the terrain's like in Afghanistan, it's very sandy, very dirty, very dusty. So initially, this huge dust cloud was created and I couldn't see anything. Now, there was no pain and I didn't know what I'd actually done. And my instinct was that we had been attacked. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought someone's fired a rocket, someone's fired a mortar, that's exploded somewhere nearby. So my fight and flight kicked in, my adrenaline spiked, and I started thinking in all chaos, not being able to see anything, you know, when this dust cloud settles, ID where the enemy are and just start raining hell down on that position. Because if I can see where they are and I start shooting, then everyone else is going to see that I've found them and they're all going to start shooting. And we had a big uh, HMG, um, big machine gun in camp, which could have just turned around and just ripped enemy, any, any enemy position to pieces. Now where I was, I knew that the way I was facing uh, behind me, about 600 meters to my rear, down beneath me where the other section were, was a small rectangular forestry block. And like I said just now, if you're going to go farm when you're on a patrol, whether you're doing it in defense or offense, you want to take cover from view and cover from fire. So I thought if anyone's attacked us, it's going to be from that small rectangular forestry block because everything else around it was just flat mud fields mm -hmm. and there were no crops or anything. It was the only form of protection. So in my mind, you know, I'm saying, turn around, turn around, turn around, find out where this came from, start shooting, get everyone to start shooting, make some sort of tactical withdrawal and get everyone out there safely. And then we're going to figure out the best plan of action to take these guys out and make sure that no one gets hurt. And after four or five times, maybe in my mind of saying, turn around, turn around, turn around, even though this dust cloud was still there and I couldn't see anything, I kind of knew that my body wasn't doing what I was telling it to do. It, it, you know, I was kind of, I know how my body feels when I'm going to turn around quickly. And it just didn't seem to be doing that. Even though I couldn't see, I, I just knew, I felt it. 
And so I waited. You know, I thought, I'm going to have to wait until this dust cloud settles, have a look around, make some very quick decisions, figure the situation out, and then do whatever I've got to do. So that's what I did. I, I waited, you know, and it got to about chest height. And this is all in, like, split seconds, you know, and, and it's like, in my mind, everything's going at 150 mile an hour. You know, so many emotions and thoughts and procedures and drills and everything. But outside, everything was like in slow motion. So it gets to the chest tight and I look around and I can't see anything. I can't see any of the lads. They've all been blasted out the area. So I carried on waiting. And then it got to ground level, hit the ground and disappeared. And then I looked down to where my legs should have been and they, they had both been completely ripped off uh, from the knees down. Like just traumatically shredded, um, gone, no, nothing left. Um, which was a very surreal thing to look at. You know, I'm, I'm sat there looking at it. There's, there's blood, claret and, and all sorts of fluids pouring out my body. I'm in no pain. I've gone into this kind of shocked, surreal dream state trying to comprehend what it was I was actually looking at. I think my, my brain was having a real difficult time trying to process it. And so, you know, I don't know if it's just the way I deal with things. I kind of try to distract myself. And again, this is seconds. I kind of look in, trying to process. And then I thought about my teammates again. So I snapped out of it instantly and I started looking around. And then I saw uh, the guy in charge again you know the look on his face and uh, the, the shock and the lack of colour kind of made me think you know this is uh, this is going on this is serious you know because you kind of when you're in that situation when there's no pain and it doesn't feel real you don't think it is and you're trying to convince yourself because your brain doesn't know what it's looking at Um. So I, I guess kind of to give myself a, a bit of a kick up the ass and a final kind of signal that, you know, this is happening, Mark, you need to figure this out quick. Mm -hmm. I went to look back at my legs just to kind of see that it was real and I wasn't imagining things. And um, as I got to like the three o'clock position when I was sweeping the floor of my eyes, I saw my arm just lying there in the sand. And... Um, from my bicep down to my wrist, the whole thing was just split open. It was just, it was like a dog chew. It was horrendous. There was no bone in it. The whole bone had been shattered. My hand was in good nick. And so I picked my hand up. I don't know why. And I kind of just looked at it and then dropped it in the sand and just let out this massive scream, you know, like through frustration when, when, all the realities and realisms came crashing down of what I had done. And I knew straight away that I've stood on an IED, yeah. you know, and, and there's a high potential that I'm going to die now, mm -hmm. you know? Um, the evacuation was, was pretty hectic. You know, we're, we're trained in that situation as bizarre as it sounds, um, not to go rushing in to help the casualty because there could be more devices around and you risk setting those off. Um, so I knew that no one was going to get to me quickly. I knew that being so close to the camp was, was a blessing and that someone, if anyone was going to get to me, they were going to do it pretty quickly. Yeah. And all the lads just, you know, they, they kicked into their drills. They remained calm and composed, um, at least on the outside. <laughs> very, very professional, brave people. And they just did everything right everything right and uh, this medic got to me he got scrambled out of the, the the camp he got to me put tourniquets on my my legs and my arm put me on a stretcher my, my right leg was still kind of attached by like a muscle tendon or something and um, my foot was kind of in my boot and that was it if you imagine kind of being side swept through the through your shins Mm -hmm. All that was really there was a, was a foot and a boot and a, a strand of muscle or something. So he had to pick my foot up and put it on my stomach. They evacuated me out of the minefield, put me in a vehicle. Then as the vehicle was climbing up the incline to go back into the camp where a helicopter was due to come and meet me and evacuate me, me and a doctor fell out the back of the vehicle. 
because oh. it was quite a steep incline. Shit, man. And yeah, the, but the driver, um, who was my sergeant major at the time, uh, WO1 Bob Toomey, swang around, reached out to try and grab me to hold me in, and he ended up grabbing the femur bone that was poking out my right leg. Um, and it didn't hurt because, you know, I had morphine at that point from the medic. So, you know, I didn't really feel anything. Yeah. And he left the doctor. The doctor went tumbling back down the hill. But there was that other group that we'd left earlier. So that there were eight armed men there to look after him. So he was fine. Yeah. And he got me to the helicopter landing site. And the last thing I remember is the Chinook landing. And the, the sandstorm that it created from the propeller blades, the heat of the exhaust... And then the kind of mechanical sound the tailgate makes as it drops. And then I blacked out, which was the point um, I later found out that I died um, before they brought me back to life. Wow. Mm. That's, uh, Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas, yeah. But uh, wow, mate. This, you know, I'd, I'd read a bit, like I said, about, about what had happened. But yeah, that's, uh, that's hard hitting that, mate. So... Uh, no doubt, obviously, you know, and it's a ob very obvious statement, but no doubt the, the road to recovery was very, very long. I can only imagine. Um, did you, what, so, so were you treated over in Afghanistan or were you flown straight back to the UK? What, how did that work? Uh, so obviously with a, a traumatic amputation like that, it's quite messy. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my, my limbs were torn off. They weren't surgically amputated. So when they, the helicopter flew me back to the field hospital, they amputated both my legs above the knee and my, and my, um, my right arm above the elbow mm -hmm. uh, in the field hospital. They cleaned out as much dirt and sand and debris as they could. They stabilized me. They flew me home Christmas morning um, where I got to Birmingham about four o'clock. And then I spent three days in a coma and then uh, woke up in intensive care and spent the next six weeks in hospital. I only had, I was very lucky, I only had three further operations wow. again just to um i think they call it debridling it's like going into your wounds with a, like a wire brush just to scrape all the gunk and dart out yeah. that may cause infections of course and that was it i did six weeks in hospital and then straight on to rehab i had to be caught to um heal up a bit more because i had a lot of open wounds and barren marks all over me um and then eventually, yeah, give him my prosthetic legs. Well, that's a, so, a, a, unbelievably quicker than I thought you were going to say. I, th I honestly thought this was going to be like you were in hospital for six months, 12 months, maybe even longer. I don't know. That's, that surprised me big time. So, um, so no doubt this, uh, this took uh, you know, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of getting used to. Um, now, if you don't mind me asking, was it at this point, did, did you have young children then? Because I know you are a dad. Um, and you, but did, did you have kids then, or have, have the, uh, did you have your children after this happened? And if you did have kids before then, but you know what, was it a big thing for, for your children or for your partner or family? Obviously, you know, not not just your children and your partner. So I had my daughter Kezia. Um, hmm. She's fifteen now. She was just under three, right, uh, when I got injured, and she doesn't know any different. Um, she only knows me like this yeah and my other two Mason and Evelyn came along after um, yeah they, they were born after um, all the good old fashioned way so um, that's all good we're all, we're all happy down there awesome but yeah <laughs> so I've got three of them 15, 8 yeah, and 7 nice. and that's it mm. your dad aren't you that's all, that's all it is dad is dad mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah now, so if, you, if you're okay, man, I'm going to skip on now because what one thing that really stood out to me was the um, a bit of info I picked up about the, the Invictus Games. Mm -hmm. So you, um, I, I'll tell you what, mate, I'm not even going to try and pretend I know anything about this. So if you don't mind, mate, you tell us a story. How did this come about? Um, you, whatever you want to tell us about this, mate, because I, I found it really interesting reading it. And to, so yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love you to tell the, uh, the listeners about that, mate. Um, so... After I was injured, it's, it's so funny. Um, people come up to you, right, when you, when you lose a limb or something. And, like, when strangers meet you, the first thing they say is, in 80% in of the cases, 
so when are you going to stop training for the Paralympics? And I'm like, I don't want to go into the Paralympics. Why does everyone keep asking me about the Paralympics? I don't want yeah. to, you know, like I said earlier, I, I did full contact kickboxing, Muay Thai, boxing. I didn't want to do like wheelchair tennis or, you know, not that there's anything wrong with those sports. They just didn't appeal to me. I, yeah. I've never done track or field events in my life. I was into contact sports and combat sports, you know? Mm -hmm. So I stayed away from sport. It was never a part of my recovery at all. And my main goal in the beginning was to leave my wheelchair behind, you know, which I did on the 9th of June, 2009. So that was my focus. I didn't care about sport or any of that. But in 2016, uh, I was in my office at home and I started drafting out my goal list for the following year. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, Christmas Eve 2017 is going to be 10 years. Do something that I haven't done yet to celebrate that occasion and 10 years of life post injury. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and I had to think about it. And then I realized that I hadn't done any sport. So I thought I'd do sport. I'll, I'll figure something out in the sport world and I'll try that this year, you know, leading up to that anniversary. Now, the Invictus Games at that point, I think, was two years old. So I had seen my friends and people that were at you know, advancing their personal lives, you know, and using the power of sport as a recovery tool. And I thought, you know what, I'll give that a shot. You know, I don't know much about it. Um, I know it's a, a thing that was dreamt up and ran by Prince Harry. I knew a lot of my friends got a lot out of it, you know, in various different forms, like I said, in, in their personal lives, professional lives, and whatever it is. So I'll do that. You know, I didn't really want to, excuse the pun, but dip my toe in the water with some club level, regional level thing. I just thought I'm going to dive straight in and go global. Mm -hmm. So I did a bit of research. I found some sports I thought would just video go backwards and forwards on a concept two row machine for four minutes and one minute anyone do that so i took that sport hands well that's more cardio again i'm sure it can't be right i used to swim before i was quite a good swimmer it's probably not that different now so i'll do that mm -hmm. and, I, and i just picked these sports what were mainly cardio based where i could just hammer myself and I, I honestly thought I'd just turn up and I'd be fitter than everyone. And that's enough. It wasn't um, at all. And I, di I didn't realize even, you know, swimming, obviously there's technique, there's strategy, hand cycling. There's a lot of, there's a lot to learn in that sport. But I thought at least in rowing, all I'm doing is going backwards and forwards. So it is literally last man standing. Whoever's the and eat their strategy there's little micro adjustments you've got to make to make you better and improve your timings and your splits and all that. And um, I just dived into it, mate, and just went crazy with the cardio. Nice. Um, yeah, and I did strength and conditioning. I was, I was here where I am now in my garage doing cardio at five o'clock in the morning, three times a week. Yeah. Then I was doing S&C in the evenings. And then on the weekends, I had to travel all over the country to go to sports specific training camps like a rowing camp one weekend then a swimming camp and they were everywhere mate. manchester liverpool leeds birmingham bristol bath plymouth it was exhausting for like an entire year of doing that on top of the day job on top of the family on top of the multiple projects but i was just like i want to do this one my, my whole vision was do this once right no one knows who you are just go in there because i wasn't in any of those sporting clicks go in there as a complete unknown in the sport world, mm -hmm. thrash everybody, drop the mic, and then walk out, all right? And that was it. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, didn't, it didn't pan out that way for me the first yeah. year. Um, you know, I think I came back the first year with two silvers and two bronzes, mm -hmm. but so, I got the- Man, this is that, that's awesome still. <laughs> yeah, it was good, but my, my goal was gold. You yeah, know, I wanted sure. gold. Um, and I got this really cool award. They, they, they pick one team and one individual from every country and every athlete to win a, an award. And um, I managed to win that award, which is cool. Nice. So although I didn't get the gold medals, I kind of thought, well, that's a nice, you know, I'm the only person in 
the team that's got that. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. But when I came home, I just, I couldn't let it lie. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I need to get the goals. And so I got a friend of mine to make me up a picture frame. And in the frame, in the middle, there's a, a giant yellow Invictus flag that loads of people have signed. And then there's two slots either side at the bottom with bronze medals, two with silver, and then there were two empty ones at the top. And I just, I put it behind me and behind the camera there is where my handbike, my rower were. Mm -hmm. And I just applied again and spent the next year training, just staring at those empty gold slots nice. that needed to be filled. And I was like, there's no way I'm not filling those slots the next year. Yeah. So I repeated the process. This time around, I learned the techniques and strategies. Um, and I, I, I did, made scientific adjustments to my training, not just stupid caveman adjustments. You know, just go faster, just go harder. <laughs> and um, had a better time of it. You know, came back with, I think, that year, four golds, two bronzes and a silver. Nice. So it's kind of cool. Awesome. That's mm. Very cool, that, mate. Very cool. Nice. Mm. So that's, yeah, um, it really interested me, that, mate. Yeah, so I'm glad you shared that with us. So now I know you've mentioned that, that your, you, you, your day job, if you like, is working for the charity. So what does that involve, mate, if you don't mind uh, telling us a bit about that? Oh, it's everything. I mean, my official title is marketing and communications officer okay so running social media campaigns recording podcasts and um, face the camera things updates that we do you know answering all the direct messages replying to queries um that's my official role but in in that world you know you just do all sorts so the other week i was giving presentations to the recruits mm -hmm. about certain aspects of the charity then maybe I'll be supporting fundraising events. Maybe I'll organize my own fundraising events. Mm -hmm. When I go and do personal speaking jobs to corporates and stuff like that, you know, generally I'll plug the charity there and they'll get a donation, hopefully strike up a relationship, a uh, long-term one. So it's, it's, it's brilliant because it complements everything that I do and want to do in my life and everything crosses over. So I'm not stuck in an office from nine to five, which is brilliant. You know, I, I go up to the commando training center every Monday to, you know, make sure I meet and spend time with all the other members of staff at least once a week. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the time I'm on the road um, or at home and I'm working remotely, doing all those different things, just trying to raise awareness and, and raise money for the charity. Nice, nice. So um, we're almost at the end now. So... One thing I like to get all my guests to uh, to do on the podcast is uh, to show us that no matter who you are, what you've achieved, what you've been through, all that kind of stuff, we all have embarrassing stories. We all have funny stories where we might have made a bit of a prat, a bit of a tit of ourselves. So, and being a being a marine mate, I know you're going to have some of these hundred percent. So, fire away, mate. Give us an embarrassing story if you can think of one off the top of your head. Okay. Um... So here's one. No holds bad, by the way. <laughs> okay. So where I live in, in Plymouth, probably a year after I was injured, they, on, the, on a big naval base here, they created a thing called Hasler Company, which started as a rehabilitation unit for Royal Marines, and then it evolved into a tri-service thing. So basically, if you get injured or become ill in the military, generally you get fixed in your unit and you go back to work. But if your injury or illness is of a nature where your career's over, you'll come down to Hazard Company, you'll rehabilitate, retrain, do all these courses, and then when you're ready, you leave. Yeah. So there was a point where all of my mates from Headley Court Rehab were down in Plymouth. And you know, we're military guys, we go out eating and drinking and partying and all that kind of stuff. And we were out one, I think it was a Sunday and the lads have been out since 12 o'clock. And then you've got to bear in mind when I say lads, you've got to think of a mob of 40 strong blokes, right? Probably about 12 legs between 40 men, mm -hmm. right? They're in wheelchairs. They've got facial scarring. You know, a friend of mine had his whole nose taken off and it, it temporarily had one made out of like, um, masking tape if you like mm -hmm. so it was it was honestly if it was like 
I imagine what the set of The Walking Dead looks like, like when we went out drinking. Okay. So it was, it was crazy, man. And they've been up since 12 o'clock, right? And I couldn't make it out until about seven. So I thought they're going to be well oiled by the time I get there. Yeah. And uh, I'm not a good drinker anymore. So I thought I'll, I'll be all right. I wasn't. And I went, <laughs> we're in this nightclub later on. And I don't remember anything from about half past 10 at night. And I woke up at like three o'clock in the morning. And it's lucky because the nightclub I was in, uh, a long time ago before I was injured, I used to work as a, a nightclub doorman. And so I knew all the lads out. Uh, the bloke who owns the company is a good friend of mine. So I was probably making a complete twat on myself, but you know, I didn't get a shoe in from any of the doorman. They actually helped me. And I woke up about three in the morning outside the club in a bus stop, right? So I lift my head up and I kind of open my eyes and in front of me is my wife. She's got a little Peugeot 106. She's in a bus lane and the boot's open, right? I look to my right. One of my prosthetic legs is 10 yards down the road to the right. Oh, one, of them, <laughs> one of them was down to the left and one of the lads the, the, had my prosthetic arm and, I, and I'd, I'd just taken all my prosthetics off and thrown them all over the street and fell asleep in a bus stop. So they put their hands under my armpits, right? Take me to the car, put me in the car. I wake up in the morning on the landing floor in my house, naked, in the fetal position, with a kebab all down the side of my face. Nice. Um, and my wife was nice enough to take a picture of me nice. to take the piss out of me forevermore. But yeah, that, that was probably one of the last embarrassing thing that I did you know it was quite a while ago but no it's a lot um, yeah it was pretty embarrassing mate it was pretty yeah. embarrassing yeah we've all like I said we've all done it we've all you know nobody's perfect we've all had a we've all probably gone a bit too far at times haven't we <laughs> oh yes <laughs> yeah right cool man so pretty much at the end now so can you let the people listening or maybe even watch on the YouTube video um, where they can find you on social media, where they can maybe look a bit more into the, the work you do with the charity, you know, wherever they can find you, mate. If you could, Twitter, Instagram, wherever it is. So I'm all over it. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, yep. um, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff. All my handles are at markormrod.com, O-R-M-R-O-D. Yep. Uh, website, www.markormrod.com. Um, pretty easy to find really online and most of my social media is linked up to the charity anyway so they can just follow the thread and it'll, oh, yeah. it'll lead them to the, the charity there so nice awesome man I'll make sure I give everything a give everything a follow that I'm not already following <laughs> thank you thank you alright mate right that's it mate we'll, uh, we'll call it a day there I massively appreciate it I know this I definitely know this episode is going to go down well mate it was a it was a cracking episode I really enjoyed that mate so thank you very much for your time again and uh, who knows, maybe we'll, we'll get to do it again in the future, mate. But uh, best of luck with your podcast as well. Which, by the way, where, where, can people, where can people check that one out? Your podcast. Where do we, uh, what's the name of it? Where do we find it? It's called the No Limits Podcast. Okay. Um, and it's on all good platforms. Yeah, cool. I'll check that out as soon as we finish recording, man. Awesome. Right. Cheers, Matt. Thanks for your time, mate. Take all right, Dan. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, mate.